that I'm really thankful I wasn't uh, that that a person named Dorcas wasn't living in my time period because I certainly would have gotten in trouble. Hey, mom, I met this really cool kid named Dorcas. That's not nice. Don't call him that. <laughs> no, his name is Dorcas, mom. Stop it. <laughs> anyway, uh, I can't help myself when I when I read names like that. You know, I was like, what were the parents thinking? Clearly, in that language, they weren't thinking anything. I guess it was probably a common name. In Revelation, we have a moving account of the vision that John has. Right? He finds himself in heaven and looking upon a great multitude. Who are they? Who is this great multitude that John sees? They are all the people, all of God's people who have suffered throughout time immemorial. They have been washed by the blood of the Lamb, meaning that they were saved by Christ and made righteous by the sacrifice on the cross. If any of you have taken the Revelation class with me, you know that this is Christianity 101. Saved by the blood of the Lamb, right? Washed clean by His blood. And they are worshiping God who has become their shelter. It says that these people are who have suffered and shall suffer no more. That God shall wipe their tears away and that there will be no more suffering or pain. There's, I don't think, much more of an apt verse in all of the Bible. I mean, more of an apt passage in all of the Bible when we think of the stuff that happened this week. Over the course of this week, between the Boston Marathon uh, bombings and the and the, the the explosion, which is probably just a workplace accident down in Texas, I mean, like all of these things that happen make us pause and think about all of the commotion and chaos that goes on in this world, all of the tears of sorrow, all of the pain and suffering that people have to to experience, and we think, gee, what what an awesome time it would be. For us to experience when God makes this world right again and we don't have to shed another tear. And we don't have to experience any more suffering or any more pain. In light of the Boston Marathon, we are reminded about how cruel and tough life in this world can be. There are people in our midst that believe that violence is the only answer to their problems. And the result of that kind of a mentality is that there are people who are now dead, or perhaps even worse, alive but maimed. It is easy for us to relate to John and to wish for a time where hope, healing, and wholeness is restored to our land. But how does such hope such healing and such wholeness come into our world. It seems that violence begets more violence, right? We've got these two guys that did what they did. Probably were not alone. I mean, they may be the ones that planted the bombs and built the bombs, but somewhere they got this this notion and the support to, to do the things that they did. And what's going to happen now? They're going to be interrogated. Well, not they. He's going to be interrogated. His family is going to be harassed. And probably by the end of it, if I had to put money down, he's going to be convicted of treason against his country and executed. One set of violence begets another instance of violence. And the vicious cycle goes on and on and on. They bomb us, we bomb them, they bomb us back, we bomb them, they bomb us back, we bomb them. Where does it end? We hear the word justice getting thrown around on the television screen and on the radios and in the newspapers. But justice usually seems to equal violent punishment. An eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. And this is certainly the case in the book of Revelation, no doubt. 
because by the time we get to the, the era where the tears are being wiped away, a good portion of the world has been wiped away, right? And God has to recreate everything. It seems like the only answer even we as Christians can come up with is violence. I mean, God literally in Revelation destroys the earth and torments the wicked with plagues before casting a lot of them into an eternal lake of fire. But is this what God is calling us to do? Won't it take a miracle? Won't it take a miracle to restore the world to paradise? And we love the idea of miracles, don't we? We love the stories of Jesus because he's the guy that walks on water. He's the guy that heals the sick and tells the lame to get up and walk. He's the guy who raises his best friend, Lazarus, from the dead. Who can do that? We're wowed by miracle stories. And what about the, the, the Acts of the Apostles? We just heard today the story of Peter raising Tabitha from the dead. Who has done such things? We are wowed by miracle stories. I mean, could you picture if you took the miracle stories out of the Bible and it was just like, hey, there was this guy, Jesus, and he taught peace and love and the Romans crucified him. And then his followers followed after them, after him, and, and what, what do you know it? They got crucified and killed too. The end. Like, where would the fun in that be? How many of us would be sitting here in church today going, wow, yes, praise God. People believed in God and got killed for it. Yes. There's got to be some great miracle story in there to, to, to get you to want to be a part of this. We love the idea of miracles. And it seems that it will take such a great and powerful miracle for God's vision of the world to get realized, doesn't it? Like, what is going to change the cycle of this world? What is going to change humans from wanting to destroy other humans? What is going to change the mentality of the people on this world? It's got to take a miracle. But we often miss the point of the miracle stories. The point was not to tell how Jesus could do really awesome stuff. Nor was it to speak of how cool Peter was. You see, real miracles are subtle, not spectacular. In fact, the, the reality of it is that most miracles pass by without us even recognizing they happened. I mean, if we could really raise people from the dead, no one would miss that. And yet here we are in a world where people even doubt that miracles truly exist. Miracles are so, not spectacular. The miracle of Jesus was not in his ability to walk on water or to raise the dead. The miracle was that he cared enough to have compassion and show mercy in a world that would show him none. The miracle of Jesus was that he forgave instead of condemning. The miracle is that as he's being nailed to the cross, having nails driven through his hands and his feet, after having been brutally whipped, blood pouring everywhere, his first reaction is, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. That's a miracle. The miracle of Jesus was that he loved instead of hated. The miracle of Jesus was that he gave without ever expecting anything back. The miracles were pointed stories that were intended to remind their readers that God could, and in fact God would, 
work through them if only they cared enough to believe that that would happen. The miracle is that we even care. In a world that demands violent justice, in a world that demands that we get vindication and vengeance upon those who have acted against us, that there would be people who say, I forgive you, is a miracle. If we want miracles to happen in and through our lives, we have to be willing to bring them about. They're not going to happen out of nowhere. If we want miracles to happen in and through our lives, we have to be willing to bring them about. We have to be willing to love, to give, to show mercy, to be kind, and to do what is right in the eyes of God. We have to be willing to care enough to try, to simply attempt to live as God is calling us to live. In the light of the terrorist attack that happened in Boston, I, wanna, I want us to look toward real life examples of living miracles. Mother Teresa, in a world of terrible poverty and terrible wealth, <laughs> who could think of wealth being terrible, right? In a world, and I've been to India, in a world where you've got some of the richest people in the world and some of the poorest people in the world living together, that there would be a woman who would say, I know I'm a woman, but I don't care what your rules say about women. I know I'm a woman who could be raped and killed and beaten for being a woman out in the street talking to people. I don't care. Because I want to do what Jesus did. I want to live on the streets and give to those people who are in need. And you know what? I don't care if they're Christian. And I don't care if they convert. Because Christ wants me to be there in their midst. The fact that there's a woman who would give up living in the shelter of a monastery and live in the streets next to those who hated her because she was a Christian. Because the common perception of Christianity was that she's going to try to convert us. A woman who would be willing to risk her life to show them that it wasn't about conversion. It was about love. Or how about Mahatma Gandhi? How about him as a living miracle? You know, they said that Mahatma Gandhi in one hand had the Bhagavad Gita, the sacred Hindu scriptures, and in the other hand, the Gospels. The Bhagavad Gita, as I have read it in its full and have studied it, is a text that teaches you about doing your duty. And it's centered around a battle. And Arjun and Krishna are discussing about what the, what the next step Arjun should take as a prince going into battle. And, and Krishna is telling him that the most important thing is not winning or losing or this or that. It's about doing your duty and doing what's right. So on one end, you have Mahatma Gandhi, who was an educated lawyer, who had traveled the world, been in South Africa, and got his education in, in Britain, and now finds himself back in India, sees that it is his duty to stand up for his people. But he's not buying into the whole war story, because he also is informed by this other set of books called the Gospels. And though he is a Hindu and never proclaims to be a Christian, he is reading the Gospels and really, really taking seriously the teachings of none other than Jesus, who said to turn your cheek when someone slaps your right cheek, to forgive if you want to be forgiven, to love even your enemies. And so he gets this notion of doing your duty and unconditional, profound love and he puts them together and lives it in a way that the rest of the world has to honor, whether it wants to or not. How about that 
as a living miracle? Or how about Oskar Schindler, who, in the midst of Nazi Germany, had everything to gain from being a Nazi, but risked his own career, his own reputation, and his own life to hide away Jewish people so that they wouldn't be killed and executed. Or how about Dr. Martin Luther King Jr., who was inspired by Gandhi and the Gospels as well, and decided, you know what, we could retaliate back against our oppressors, or we could do things the way God would want them done, and peacefully resist. Hoping that one day we'll all come together and the tears shall be wiped away from all of our eyes and the pain and suffering no longer. These are real examples of living miracles. The key is, if you want to see a miracle, you have to be willing to be a miracle. The miracle of miracles is no magic trick. The miracle of miracles is the very reality of compassionate love, of unconditional kindness in a world that is filled with cruelty and hate. What the Gospels call us to do is to live in love. And if we do, in fact, live in love, we will be that miracle. Let us pray. <clears throat> Gracious God, we understand that you have called us to a great purpose in this life. You've called us to not be of this world though we live in it, but to be ambassadors of your kingdom, the very kingdom that Jesus taught about, the kingdom that loves instead of hates, the kingdom that provides shelter instead of ridicule and shame. The kingdom of you, our God. Lord, we ask that though we are not perfect and though our seeking to be ambassadors of your kingdom is a progression that carries through our entire life, that you will be a light within us that guides us toward the life you are calling us to live that molds us and shapes us from mere human beings to truly being your children made in your image. Lord, we thank you and we praise you for this opportunity to show your love. Use us and guide us in the ways that you will. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.